left before Christmas. <laughs> and to a child, 19 days to Christmas seems like a long time. But we know that it's going to be here before we know it. Now, I've titled my message this morning, Why Christmas? In other words, why do we have Christmas? Most of us have heard the expression, Jesus is the reason for the season. And that's true, but that doesn't explain very much. And most of us have grown up celebrating Christmas all our lives. We're very familiar with the traditional Christmas story from the Bible of God sending his son Jesus to be born as a baby. And this morning, I'd like to dig a little deeper and uncover the reason why God sent his son to be born. Okay, and to do that, I'm going to use this sketch board. I use this at Kids Club, and it's a really um, nice way to just highlight the story. Okay, so um, to get started, to answer the question, why we have Christmas, we're going to answer another question first. And that question is, how does, does a person go to heaven? What do you have to do to make sure you're going to heaven? And most people, if you ask them, they'll say, well, you have to be a good person. You have to be a good person to get to heaven. So we are going to find out this morning. Oops. Oh, that's it. Disrespect. 
judgeful. So um, that's called blasphemy, taking the name of the Lord in vain. think we would deserve to go to heaven or to hell. Now, if we're guilty, justice demands punishment, right? And the place of punishment is total separation from God forever in a horrible place called hell. And nobody likes to talk about it. I don't like to talk about it. The Bible describes hell more than it does heaven. It talks about a place of uh, darkness and uh, weeping torment, gnashing of teeth, and it's forever. So, and many people <laughs> make light of heaven because it's such a, a horrible place, but nobody in their right mind would ever want to go there. So I've, I've explained the bad news. Now we've found out that none of us are good people by God's standard, and we're all going to be held accountable for the lives that God's given us. But I have good news. Because God is a God of love and mercy, and he's not willing that any should perish. And now we're going to get to the reason why we have Christmas. Because about, uh, about 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, Jesus, to be born in Bethlehem. And um, the angels announced this to the shepherds. He said, today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He was without sin. He was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He was 100% God, but he was also 100% human. And in the book of John, it tells us that in the beginning was the Word, which was Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's what happened at Christmas. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And for about 33 years, Jesus preached uh, through Israel. He performed miracles. He made blind people see. He made deaf people hear. He made lame people to walk. He fed over 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish, and he even raised people back from the dead. He demonstrated his power through his miracles. And 
many people recognize that he was the promised Messiah, the Savior of mankind, and they followed him. But many people rejected him, too. And that's the same way today. Many people recognize who he is, the Savior, and follow him, and many people reject him. Now, the people that rejected Jesus hated him, and they had him arrested, charging him with blasphemy, charging because he claimed to be the Son of God. But the thing was, he is the Son of God. And they had him arrested and crucified. And Jesus, we you know, died on the cross. And as Jesus was dying on the cross, God laid all our sin upon him. All the things that we've done against God's law are, are against God. And Jesus was punished for us. It says, he, the Father, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. The cross is where God's justice was satisfied. We broke God's law, but Jesus paid our fine. God says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And Jesus shed his blood on the cross for our sin. And now God can pardon us because he's punished his son. After Jesus died, they took down his body, they laid him in a tomb, and three days later, he rose from the dead. And he is alive forevermore. He conquered sin and death for us. So, now God can legally pardon our sin because it's been punished by his son. And we can be forgiven and receive eternal life because of the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the good news. Now we can be forgiven. And not only forgiven, but we have the promise of heaven. Now, I like to use this courtroom analogy that helps to bring this point home. Imagine you're guilty of a serious crime. Say you robbed a bank and, and murdered someone, and you're arrested, you're tried, convicted, and you're sentenced to life in prison with no chance of parole, no hope for the future, and you're standing there helpless. Suddenly, someone comes into the courtroom and says, Judge, this is my friend. I love her. And I'm willing to take her punishment and sacrifice my life so that she can go free. That's a picture of what Jesus did for us. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. For Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. And now everyone has a choice to make. We can either continue in our sin and pay for it ourselves, or we can accept God's offer of mercy and forgiveness by, by turning from our sin and trusting in Jesus as Savior. And Jesus warns, though, that not everyone is going to trust in him. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to life. I mean, sorry. Wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. And I think the reason it's so, one of the reasons it's so difficult is that we have to strip away all our pride and humble ourselves before God. C.S. Lewis said that there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those who will humble themselves, bow their knee, and say to God, Thy will be done. And then there are those who refuse to humble themselves before God. And God says to them, your will be done.
So if you don't want anything to do with God, God will allow that. But if you want your sins forgiven, if you want a personal relationship with the living God who loves you, who created you, who sent his son to die for your sin, if you want to know that you're going to heaven when you die, you're going to have an opportunity today to receive God's forgiveness. You have to do two things. One is repent, and repent's an old-fashioned word. It just means to confess your sin and forsake it. You can't continue to live a sinful lifestyle if you're following Christ. He died for our sins so that we could be set free from them. You have to be willing to give up all your sin. And the other thing is to trust in Jesus, to trust him as your Lord and your Savior. He died for you. He loves you. And think of it like this, because trusting in Jesus is not just intellectual knowledge, believing in him. Um, if, if you're in an airplane that's going to crash, and the pilot comes on and says, there's a parachute under your seat. Well, it's not going to be enough just to know that there's a parachute and believe that it can save you. You've got to put your faith and trust in that parachute by putting it on and trusting that when you jump, it's going to save you. And that's the same with Jesus. The Bible says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make him your Lord. Trust that his death and resurrection was for you personally. And the moment that you repent and trust in Christ, God knows our hearts. He knows if we mean it. He promises to forgive all of our sin. He promises to put the Holy Spirit in our lives, to give us the power to live above our circumstances, to live for him. And the scripture says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. This life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So if you would like to repent of your sin and put your faith and trust in Jesus, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. I know that that's not a comfortable thing to do in front of other people, but Jesus said, if you confess me before others, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. And he also said, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. Maybe you're a professing Christian, but you recognize that you've never truly repented, never been born again, filled with the Holy Spirit. Or maybe you've strayed from the Lord and you've let other things get in, crowding him out and making that have become more important to you than your relationship with God. Well, this is an opportunity for you today to make sure you're right with God, your creator. So if you would like to truly repent from your heart, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Is there anybody who understands they're, they're standing before God and knows they recognize they need salvation? I know God's speaking to some people. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. <coughs> Okay, today is the day that you leave your life of sin and you begin a new life with Jesus as your Lord. The Bible says when you become a Christian, a child of God, the old has gone and the new has come. You're a new creation. So I'd like everyone to bow their head as I pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We worship you as our creator and God. Your word says that you demonstrated your great love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you that he didn't stay dead, but he rose from the grave and is alive forevermore. I pray for these women now who are turning to you today. I pray that you would give them a humble and repentant heart. I ask you to forgive their sin and fill them with the Holy Spirit to walk in victory in Christ and give them assurance of their salvation. Deliver them from the evil one and lead them not into temptation. 
And I pray your blessing on all of us, Lord. We ask you to bless us, keep us, make your face to shine upon us, and give us peace. And we ask this in the powerful name of the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, now, if, if this is the prayer of your heart, you need to make this your own. Um, and so I really suggest going home and, and finding some quiet place where you can just be alone and be real with God and confess your sin, thank Jesus for dying for you, and ask him to help you walk on that narrow path that leads to life, and he will. He, um, w there are some very important principles that, as Christians that we need to follow to be a successful Christian, because this being born again is the first step, but it's a lifetime of following Christ. And the most important advice I can give you is to read your Bible every day. Start in the book of John. That's God's word that gives us um, his heart to us. He's, it's his love letter to us. And um, just like we got to eat food every day to keep our bodies healthy and strong, we got to feed our spirits on the word of God every day to stay spiritually healthy and strong. And the other one is prayer. Get in the habit of talking to God. He's always there. He wants to hear from you. He loves you. Thank him for things. Ask him for help when you need it. He's, he's more than able. And then find a good church where you can get involved. And uh, share what God is doing in your life with other people. Everybody needs Jesus. Everybody is going to be held accountable for their lives. And we know, we heard that Jesus died for us. And we have no excuse. So share the good news with people that God sent Jesus to die for you so that you could be forgiven and saved. Okay? Now, salvation is a gift from God. It's not something we deserve. It's not something we earn. The Bible says that, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And becoming a Christian doesn't mean that everything's going to be rosy and smooth. In fact, Jesus said, In this life you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And now we have the Holy Spirit that helps us overcome. And so why Christmas? Why do we celebrate Christmas? Well, God sent his son Jesus to be born at Christmas so that at Easter he could die on the cross for our sin, rise from the dead, defeating sin and death so that we can have eternal life. Okay, and I thank you very much for your attention. I wish you all a Merry Christmas, and God bless you.